personal finance, which is the um, session held by the BIBF in collaboration with uh, Bahrain Borsa. Uh, so uh, to begin with, um, I would like to just give a brief introduction. Uh, so this is Manna Abdul Malik. Um, I have over 15 years of experience uh, in the banking industry. Uh, I've worked, I've had the privilege to work with several uh, investment and international banks. Uh, my current role is a director in commercial, corporate and institutional banking with Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, through my years of experience, I've worked with several segments, including retail, SMEs, corporate uh, and investment banking. And as a qualification, I hold an MBA from the uh, University of Strath Strathclyde. Um, so I hope today's session will be as informative and as inciting as possible. Um, and we will be trying to dedicate the last session, the last part of the session for any questions that you might be having regarding the, the topic. So please do bear with me and hopefully I will be able to answer any questions that might arise towards the, the end of the session. Um, so to begin with, um, so personal finance, um, to understand what personal finance is and to be able to know how to manage it, um, let's break it down into four key quadrants or components. To begin with is financial planning. Um, so what is financial planning? How important it is to you? And then to move on to how you are supposed to plan your spending. And here we will be covering very important areas about budgeting, spending and saving. And then from there, we will be moving to the topic of how to manage your liquidity. So how do I manage my savings and whether I need to borrow or not? And what are my investment options? And finally, but the most important is how to manage my risk, which is your risk management. And to start um, on financial planning. So basically it is the process of managing your personal finances by determining the ways to earn, spend, save and invest your money to achieve your financial and life goals. So basically the purpose of financial planning is to help you manage your earnings, manage your funds in a way to achieve your ultimate goals in life and your financial goals. And to break it down further, what we need to understand as components of financial planning is what is my net worth? What is it that I really have today? What are my actual liabilities, my obligations? What are my cash flows? And what are my key priorities in terms of goals? And eventually, how do I execute the plan that I arrived at? And what would be my tools to do so? Now, when I speak about relevance, now who should be doing financial planning? Financial planning is absolutely applicable to anybody and everybody. Today, whether you are a school student, whether you are a postgraduate, whether you are about to retire, financial planning absolutely applies to you and it is never too late to do it. Accessibility, now whether or not I have the ability to do financial planning, yes, you can. With a little bit of understanding and knowledge and awareness, which is something like today's session is, for example, helping you to, you can actually do it. While there, of course, there are experts out there that do offer financial planning as their services, but yes, you can do it and you are capable of doing it. So let's understand the process of financial planning. What's the framework? Um, what is the methodology? How do I do it? So first we need to understand what is my current financial situation today? How much do I own? So do I have a property? Uh, do I have some savings or some cash in the bank? Um, maybe I have some stocks in the market or some bonds. Um, so to keep it very simple, it is basically what you have today. And then I need to also understand what are my financial liabilities? Um, do I have any loans? Uh, do I have any credit cards uh, that I have to settle? So basically understand that this today from day one, this is my financial situation. And then as I move to the second step is where I ba basically understand what my cash flows are. So this is how much I'm earning on monthly basis. This is my steady income. 
Some of it might be income that I'm getting on some regular basis through other sources. But any, anyway, here what is important to focus on is what is my steady income. So it's not, for example, the income that might or might not come through. Oh, I might be selling a land and I might be getting this income. No, because this might or might not happen. It's very important to understand that when you're looking at your cash flows, look at what is that you are getting on steady basis. And then, of course, you are going to offset it with how much expenses also that you have to pay on monthly or regular basis. Now here we need to understand something very important about expenses. My expenses can be divided into three. One is my obviously any debt obligations, right? Any installments that you have to pay. This is one type. The other type is your fixed expenses. Now these are the expenses that you have to pay anyway. For example, your rent, your electricity bills. Um, if you have kids, it's the school fees, um, the insurance that you have to pay on your car. Um, these are your fixed expenses. And then the third type is your variable expenses. And the reason I want you to focus on this will come in a little bit later. So your variable expenses are the expenses that are basically dependent on your consumption. They are determined by your consumption. So for example, how much groceries you have to buy this month is dependent on how much you want to spend on groceries. Um, your car, your car, the installment on your auto loan is a fixed debt obligation, but how much you pay for fuel is actually dependent on how much you consume the car. So, so it's, it's very important to just understand uh, the concept of expenses and how we can actually segregate between them broadly, your fixed and debt obligations and your variable expenses. And then we move on to the third step, which is OK. Now I need to know what I want to achieve. Um, let's say what I want to achieve is 12 months from now. I want to save maybe 100 dinars, 70 to 100 dinars every month from my cost. So by 12 months, I would have saved 1000 to 1200 dinars in the year. This is this could be this could be one of your goals that in 12 months time I want to achieve this much saving this what we call is a short term goal. It's your goal that is within a period of 12 months and then my next goal could be well you know what in three years I want to have a car. So maybe the amount of savings that I'm achieving from now until three years will give me something around 3000 BD could be my down payment for a new car. Now this three years plan is basically what we call as a medium term plan. And then we have the um, what we call a long term plan. And this is basically what you want to achieve in maybe 10 years. So maybe you would say in 10 years, yes, I want to own my own house, for example. So OK, so what we are left with here, I have in a year I want to have this much saving in three years. I want to buy a car in 10 years. I want to own a house. OK, so I know my situation. I understand my cash flows. I know my goals. Now the next part, and this is the most important part, is how do I achieve it? And this is where comes the execution of the financial plan. First, you need to set your budget and we're going to talk a bit more about that. All right, and then you need to see what your options are based on your budget. Are you in a deficit? Are you in a surplus? And the words might sound a little bit, uh, maybe a bit of an analogy here, but we're going to explain exactly what that means. But then based on my deficit or surplus situation, I then might want to consider my options. Do I have saving options? Do I have investment options? Do I have borrowing options? So go more into details i would like just to brush through some important considerations about financial planning and the part that we spoke about so far first of all keep it simple all you need is a spreadsheet or even just a pen and paper right it, it does not have to be anything don't over engineer it and don't overthink it keep it simple 
When setting your goals, make them realistic yet aspirational. So, for example, in, in, the, in the example that I just gave about the savings that you want to do and then to probably buy a new car three years down the road. Now, if I know that I will be saving up to 3000 BD, then I know that the car that I will buy is probably not a Lamborghini or a Bentley, right? Because it has to make sense. So it's OK to aspire to say maybe consider a Camry. It's still a nice car. It's still aspirational, but it's more realistic. So this is a very important thing when you're doing your financial planning. Keep it real, keep it doable, but it's not a bad thing to aspire for better and better. But the minute you overdo it, it might sound a bit difficult at times that you might give up. So this is very important to consider when you are actually doing your financial planning. Ensure you're always checking in. Are you on track? So I, I sat down today. I figured out what I want to do. So three months down the road, I need a check in. Are my savings on track? Oh, I'm maybe a few dinars here and there out. OK, then I know I need to make it up for the months to come. So always stay checked in. Remember, financial planning is an ongoing process because your goals may change and evolve over time. So now I want I know I want to buy a new car three years down the road, but maybe one or two years down the road that plan changes. It's OK as long as you know that you are constantly being alert of what your goals are and you are actually on track towards them. That's fine. So remember, financial planning is not a one time process. It's an ongoing process. When challenges arise, it's not a U-turn, but rather a detour. What do I mean by that? If let's say one year down the road, I managed to save my first thousand BD and I'm too excited that I did it, right? But then something comes out of nowhere and I have to spend it elsewhere. That's okay, that's fine. So it's not a U-turn. That does not mean that you need to go like, oh, you know what, my whole plan is gone. Even the car plan is gone. The house car plan is gone. No, it's not because what has happened in that one year when you have actually saved that thousand D is that I've actually you've learned in the process how to do it. So now for you, the second and third can actually be more for you because now you know things that you can do. You know things that you managed to give up to save on your costs. So it's very important to remember that when you have a plan and even when things do not go as per the plan, it's OK. You just have to rethink about it. So now maybe the three years will be four years and hence the detour. It might take longer, but you can still be on track for your goals. Even if you're a fresh graduate, does it make sense to do financial planning? I, I still don't have a job. I don't know how much my income will be, let alone how much I could spend. Financial planning is at any time and point of your life. Remember, we all actually started financial planning when we were just kids and you might go like, how did that happen? I'll tell you when the first time your daddy gave you your pocket money to go and spend it on some maybe confectionery Hello? from the old store, you actually started financial planning. Hello? You were like, OK, I have one dinar. I need to spend this much. I want to send you the email. Cola or the ice cream. And you know what? There is this magazine that I want to buy as well. So how am I going to do it? Actually, we start financial planning at a very young age. So some way or the other, financial planning is a very important part of our lives. So we have to understand that for us to have stable personal financing um, scheme in our life, we need to do financial planning. It, it, it doesn't go without it. So now the, the interesting part, how do I plan my spending? And again, please remember the point about variable costs that I mentioned. So now I'm doing my budget. So what is a budget, right? A budget is basically saying that 12 months from now, based on the priorities that I had set, I want to be at point X. So to be at point X by the end of the 12 months, I will need to make sure that my earnings are A, my spendings are B, and when I say A and B, it's certain amounts, so they're quantifiable. OK, so I need to earn this much. I need to spend this much to get at this much by the end of 12 months. This is your budget. You're basically saying this is what I need to do to get from here until there in 12 months time. 
So basically, it's a forward looking view of your 12 month financial goal by which you set quantifiable parameters. Now, depending on your surplus or deficit position, you need to assess your liquidity options. OK, what does that mean? So when I did my budget, I realized that to get a point X at the end of 12 months, all right, actually, my earnings are not sufficient enough to cover my spendings or the level where my spendings would be, right? OK, so what do I do? Because this situation is called a deficit situation, right? Now, there is also the very nice scenario, which is the best case scenario when actually my budget is in surplus. So basically my earnings are sufficient enough to cover my spendings. All right, and hence I have the surplus that is going to eventually get me to the goal that I want to achieve in 12 months. OK, so when it's a surplus situation that calls for what we call savings and maybe investments, right? But when it's a deficit situation, this is where we will need to talk about spending and maybe borrowing. OK. So when we are talking about spending and hence the concept of variable cost that I talked to you about, it's very important to understand and it's something that we see it everywhere in the world, even amongst the huge and gigantic organizations of, of the world. The first thing they do when there is a little bit of a market issue or an economic problem is cost cutting and how they do that. They do it through their variable costs. So today I know that, for example, I have to spend this much on my groceries over a period of a month. Maybe I have to spend 150. Now this 150, can it be 100? Maybe there are some extras from here and there that I can remove. And this is how I start saving. I look at my variable costs, things that I can do, maybe tighten the ship a little bit and I can save more. OK, that's one way to do it. Controlling your spending, understanding what are the things that you need, what are the things that you want and what are the things that are excessive? And hence, accordingly, you decide how to eliminate and reduce and hence manage your overall spending. And then obviously when you have done that, you might be in a position where you say, OK, now I'm covered. My budget looks good. I have to tighten the ship a little bit for 12 months, but it's fine. I'll do it right. And then you have the situation where, OK, I did that a bit of tightening, but I still need a little bit extra. This is where we will talk about liquidity options, right? But let me before getting there is also talk a little bit about the other side when you're actually in surplus and you've managed to get a little bit extra more. And this is where you will start saving. And even here, when you have that option, you still have liquidity options to consider. And this is what's going to take us to. The important part about the different ways to manage your liquidity, whether you are in a surplus or you are in a deficit, how do you manage that? All right, so here on today, I'm in a surplus. I have some extra cash that I can keep on the side and hence I would consider my saving options, right? That could be done through regular current or saving accounts with the option of Islamic or conventional uh, banks. Now, some accounts, they actually offer you an interest or profit rate. Um, and these are basically called call accounts where they are normal, regular current accounts, but actually you get paid interest on daily basis, depending on how much balance is left in the account overnight. Fixed deposits, these are accounts where your money will actually be locked for a period of time. It can be a month, it can be a year, it can be five years. And for that period, you will be, of course, earning the interest that you need on, on your deposits. However, it's important to know that for fixed deposits, your principal or your capital, the amount of money that you've actually put in is always protected. And then we have structured deposits. Now, these kind of deposits act quite similarly to a fixed deposit. However, usually the, the tenors for these deposits are usually minimum of two years and they do have a higher rate of return than a fixed deposit. But a, an important thing to know here that not always that the capital will be protected. 
So sometimes in some of these structured deposits, you will have to take a bit of risk on the amount of money that you have initially invested or saved. And then you have the savings scheme. Savings schemes uh, offered by a lot of employers, highly recommended, highly recommended to anybody who is working for an organization that offers savings scheme because uh, usually these schemes, they allow you to park side part of your salary for your period of employment and this can actually be your emergency fund um, so it's it's very important to to see if you're if you are working for an organization that offers this scheme then please do and go and ask about it and get to know a bit details about how much you can save and what benefits you will get and i would totally recommend uh, that you go for it now what is the purpose of of saving regardless of which type of saving you would go for. Be future ready for any unexpectations uh, that could happen. Um, I think we've all lived the pandemic and we've seen how unexpected events can happen and when times come where you will need to dig a bit deeper into your pockets. So your pockets should be ready for that. Uh, prepare for your retirement. Saving sometimes will help you retire at a younger age um helps achieve short-term goals now with savings usually for our six months to 12 months plans it helps us achieve those goals could be even sooner um and with the savings you're also improving your liquidity position that you have to rely less on borrowing now moving on to borrowing so we spoke about savings and that if i have that extra little cash that i can save now, when does borrowing come into the picture? Borrowing is an option when you want to cover your budget deficit. So I'm a little short on cash. So what do I do? I start thinking about loans. Availing a loan from a bank, such as personal mortgage, auto loans, and credit cards are interest bearing. So here, a very important thing to understand is what would be my cost of borrowing, right? Loans can be secured and unsecured. An example of a secured loan is, for example, a mortgage where you avail a loan from the bank, but it's backed by the property that you're buying. That's an example of a secured loan. An unsecured loan could be your, like a personal loan where you usually do not have any kind of collateral or tangible security that is offered to the bank. Um, usually, secured loans tend to be lower in cost than unsecured obviously because to the bank the risk on those are lower hence the interest could be lower now leveraging is a way to borrow at lower cost what do i mean by that and let me give that as as an example today for example i might be having a credit card let's say the limit on this credit card is 5000 bd and against that credit card i'll go to the bank and i'll tell them you know what i have a fixed deposit for 5000 let's say I'm willing to pledge it against the credit card, okay? So I'll have a credit card that is backed by cash. So to the bank, this became a secured credit card. Now, in return, what will happen is that the bank would be willing to reduce the interest rate on my credit card. So first of all, I'm earning interest on my fixed deposit. And the bank, on the other hand, is because this is secured, they are reducing my cost or my interest on the credit card. So in some situation, I would in some situations I would actually be able to match both. So in essence, I might end up actually not paying that much additional interest to the bank on my credit card. So this what what we call this that this concept is is actually called leveraging and this is what some people do to help reduce their cost of borrowing your monthly borrowing obligations as in your installments should not exceed and cannot exceed 50 percent of what we call the debt burden ratio which is your dbr right so you go to any bank the first thing they ask you what are the current installments that you have? Because as a requirement and as mandated by the Central Bank of Bahrain, you cannot be paying more than 50% of your income as loans. And as a very important point of guidance, please do not, do not 
fall for that trap as maybe you would find certain maybe institutions willing to give you that sort of exception with certain approvals. Please do not do that. Ideally, your income. The amount of borrowing that you should have ideally should not exceed 20 to 30 percent of your income. So keep that as a guideline and always be mindful of it. Maintain a good credit score. Now there is a report that is called the Credit Report Bureau that we as banks, we are we always uh, basically generate to understand the performance um, or your account conduct performance with other banks. So basically any history of defaults, any history of post dues, um, please always be mindful that once you have become part of the, I would say the banking system in terms of borrowing as a borrower, um, always be mindful to make sure your credit score is always neat and clean because this is what's going to decide for a bank to actually give you the product or service you want or not. Now, what is the purpose of borrowing and why would we borrow, right? Optimize the use of funds without having to dig deep into your pocket. Now, sometimes it's okay, like the example that I just gave about leveraging, right? I would be borrowing through the credit card, though I have the cash, right? But sometimes it's OK to have a mix of both. Why? Because sometimes you always need to have that extra cash always available for any sudden emergencies. So for example, let's say I have 5000 cash with me and I want to buy a new car. Now I'm going to pay a down payment for the car. Now this down payment can be the entire 5000 or can be a 3000 and the 2000 extra will be added to the auto loan that I will be taking. So. What I would choose to do is I would actually end up paying 3000 as a down payment, making sure I have this 2000 in case for any emergencies and this two additional thousand BD that I would add to the car loan. I would check with the bank and understand exactly the cost and maybe it would not make a big difference in my monthly installment, but I would still have that extra bit cash on the side. Improve liquidity while having the steady income to meet those obligations. So yes, again, when we are talking about a position, a deficit, I know that with this a bit of personal loan, I'm able to actually match my expenses and hence, you know, cover my deficit for a period of, of time. Allow you to meet immediate mismatches. For example, the use of credit cards. You know, credit cards, a lot of people um, use it, while well, a lot of people use it maybe for certain miles or points, but Again, today, maybe I want to buy something and I know that my, let's say my salary is coming in in two weeks time. So I can use the credit card today and I know that in two weeks time I'm going to settle it. So I'm interest free, uh, but this is exactly what the use of it comes in handy to meet immediate mismatches. I have a requirement, a payment to make. I don't have the immediate cash or income, so I used it to meet that obligation or pay that requirement. And then in two months, in two weeks time, when I get my salary, it's done. Important things to know about debt. Understand the difference between fixed and floating rate. Important, very important, especially at times when interest rates are rising. Similar to the times we're in right now. A fixed rate is basically an interest rate. I'll come and tell you your rate on this loan is 2.5% fixed, which means for whatever period of that loan, your rate is not going to move up or down. It's going to simply stay 2.5, whereas a floating rate, which is a function of a base rate plus the margin that the bank charges is what we call a floating rate that can basically move with the market movement of the benchmark base rate up and down over a period of time, whichever is the period of your loan. So what that means is that at times when the interest rates are rising, my floating rate will keep on going up, whereas my fixed rate is stays locked in. But also in periods where interest rates are going down, I will end up paying less, whereas my fixed loan rate stays static. Always ask about the effective interest rate, not just the applied interest rate. So Effective interest rate is basically your true cost of borrowing. What banks or what institutions tend to tell you is the applied rate. And this is what you need to know the difference. Always, whenever you are about to approach a bank for any loan, ask 
this is my applied rate. What is my effective rate? The reason being is that some of the charges and some of the costs tend to be within the interest rate that you're being charged on effective basis. And that's why it takes me to the sec the third point is you need to be very well aware of what are all the charges that the banks uh, or financial institutions are offering you. Legal costs, um, insurance costs, be it. Be aware of all of these. Now, be also be aware that the longer the tenor, the higher the interest rate. Do not finance your wants with debt. What does that mean? I want to have a tour in Europe. Let me take a loan. No, unless it's for a medical reason, right? That's different because that is not a want. That is a must or a need. Keep your financing, keep your debt requirements need based. Do not finance the luxuries. Do not finance the unnecessities. Finance the necessities when it is needed. Understand your refinancing options. Now, always you would see banks every now and then coming and telling you, oh, you're top, you can top up, you can refinance. Refinancing is good, but also remember that usually with refinancing, you are extending the loan repayment period, and hence you are ending up paying additional interest. So always remember, because not always when you are refinancing, and obviously the bank might be luring you in by offering you a lower interest rate, also remember that with this lower interest rate, I'm still paying additional interest maybe to another bank or to the sim similar bank, but I'm extending my loan repayment period. So be aware of this. Not always is refinancing the right option. Do your research for your bank before you actually choose one. Shop around. Make sure you've done your research on the bank. Not always the bank that is offering you the lowest pricing is the right bank, because usually when you're dealing with a bank, you're dealing with a bank for more than one product and service. So make sure that you have shopped around well before you actually make up your mind. Now, moving to the third part of liquidity management. So we've covered savings, we've covered debt. Now we're going to move on to investments. OK, when you have surplus funds, free money, and remember the, word, the words free money well, how do you deploy them to make more money? So depending on how much risk I can take, and of course, what is the kind of return that I need? I will then consider what are the investment options that I have. So when I say investments, what do I what am I talking about? Stocks, bonds, options, hedge funds, cryptocurrency are all sorts of investments that are available to you today. So I have money. I can put it in an investment and this investment is going to generate back money to me. Now, there are other kinds of more structured long term investments, such as education or life insurance. Now, another form of investment is if you are aspiring to become an entrepreneur, then you can also consider having your own startup business and what you would need is a seed capital. And with your little little extra cash that you have, you can do it. And of course, remember that there are institutions that also facilitate this. Uh, and they are available uh, here in Bahrain. Now, what is the purpose of investments? Using your free money to make more money. I have some money. Why leave it idle in account when I can actually get money on it? And always remember, one of the options or a few of the options that we spoke about in the savings is such as fixed deposits or so, right? They do actually make you earn money as well, but usually with investments, the rate of return tend to be higher than that of, you know, the regular vanilla saving schemes or saving options that you would have. Some investments allow you to have steady long term income. So, for example, if you're investing in bonds, uh, you would have the regular payment. It could be quarterly, semi annual, annual uh, coupon payments, right? Um, so it gives you that sort of steadiness and it would be a different source of income other than your existing source of income, let's say your salary. Investments can help you achieve your retirement plan even sooner. 
similar to how, how savings also will help you that way. And it helps you diversify your source of income. So today I have, let's say, my salary, but also with doing a bit of investments on the side, I can also help have other sources of income contributing to my budget. Important things to know about investments. Ideally, you should use your free money to invest. Now, what does free money mean? Free money is, as the name might imply to you, it's basically the excess cash that I have that I know is there, but it's not going to maybe worry me too much if, God forbid, I lost it. And again, we will come to the concept of risk and return, but free money is just the excess money that I have on the side that is not really a, I would say, an important or significant contributor to my existing income or earnings. I can live without it, so I can park it on the side. And this is called your free money. Some investments are not principal protected. So remember, some investments will not guarantee you that, let's say, the 1,000 BD that you've invested is going to come back. So always, always be sure that you're quite thorough of any risk involved whenever you are deciding to go with any investment. If you lack the knowledge, but you have the interest, oh, I'm been hearing Bitcoin is doing very well. I have the interest, but I don't know much about it. Please research, read, ask experts, but never go in blindly. Do not put your eggs in one basket. Do not put all your eggs in one basket. What do I mean by saying this? Today, for example, if I have 1000 BD that I can invest, will I go and put all of it in Bitcoin? No. Would I go and put it all in some, you know, stocks or bonds? No. Always make sure that you are considering more than one option where you are allocating your money accordingly. So if one part of it goes down, the other side might help you offset it. Let me give it to you through an example. When the COVID started, and let's say I had an investment where I put some money in maybe healthcare, and some money in hospitality or tourism as an investments, right? Now, when the pandemic started, I'm sure we all know that hospitality and the travel segment, they've gone severely bad because of the pandemic and the effect on it with all the lockdowns and people cannot travel and so on. Whereas the healthcare segment, they've done very well, extremely well, or not just healthcare, maybe even the likes of Samsung, for example with all the iPads and the laptops that people had to buy because of working from home, learning from home. So if I had split my money between these two or three, so whatever loss that I had made on the travel sector would have been offset and compensated by the money that I made on the healthcare or the electronics sector. And this is what we mean by not putting all your eggs in one basket. Because if one of them goes bad, there will always be other options that will help you balance it. Google or social media, they do not always give you the right answers. Please always make sure that whatever information you are using to make your decisions is based on reliable resources. For example, when we're talking investments, right, you have to understand what platforms will be giving you the right insight, right? So for example, the likes of Bloomberg, this is a platform where you can get up to date, reliable resources of information about investments that you want to make, not Google. And why some might argue Twitter, but definitely not Twitter. Risk management. This is now a very fundamental part of our presentation today. When I am actually talking about, you know, having my budgets, having my goals, having my plans set, right? It's very important to understand that some of my choices might involve certain level of risk, right? And with that level of risk, I need to understand, okay, for me to take this much risk is because I know my return, how much I can gain out of it is also matching. So it's the concept of risk and return right? The higher the risk that I take, the higher should be my return. So whenever you're going into a decision, 
and especially when it comes to investments, right? Be it uh, investing in the market or investing in your own business. Please remember that whatever risk you are taking, all right, has to be compensated by the return. If there is a mismatch between these two, then something is not right. So first of all, diversification is very important, which we just spoke about in a bit of detail. Your choice of savings, borrowings, investments should be aligned with your, with your budget. And please do not overburden your finances. And this comes in the fact that I said, when you have to keep your goals real, and you know what is the capacity that you have in terms of earnings and cash flows and so forth, right? Do not overburden by taking a bit more loans or by deciding to go a bit steep with your investments. And hence, you're cutting too much down on the cash you have in hand because you've invested a lot of your money. You locked in a lot of your money. Remember, financial planning is supposed to help you achieve your goals, but not to overburden yourself. Expect the unexpected. That is why savings are important and it's your emergency funds. Do not speculate and do not be guided by hearsay when making your decisions. So you are not there to make money uh, based on opinions. Do not put your money in a place where you're just relying on some information that you overheard from somebody. Right. Always make sure that you are well informed that your decision is based on actual reliable understanding and knowledge. And probably that is why platforms like this today is helping you achieve that right to improve your knowledge and your awareness. When you're unable to read too much in the future, stick with short term plans. If you feel it's too soon for you to know where you want to be three years or five years or 10 years from now, it's OK. Stick to 12 months. Do your planning for 12 months, and that is fine. That is completely fine. Get to the 12 months mark and then move forward and keep moving forward until you know you are ready to make those long term or medium term plans. So in summary, what I would be saying is that financial planning is critical to managing your personal finances. Manage your daily life with budgeting so you can achieve your goals. Keep your goals real. Do not burden yourself. Understanding and managing your personal finances are crucial to everybody, regardless of your age group. Broaden your knowledge and awareness as this will increase your options. Do not put your eggs in one basket. Utilize the digital platforms available today to help you manage your finances, such as digital banks. Today we are in the digital era. Use the social media platforms to start up new businesses, for example. Today, for example, a platform like Instagram is one of the popular, the most popular platforms for startup businesses. Educational platforms as the ones that BIBF is offering you to expand your knowledge. So with this, I would have come to the end of my session. I would now look into seeing if there are any questions that you would have. Thank you, and I hope it was an informative session for all of you. Uh, just a reminder, uh, please do follow the BIBF and to learn more about Investment Academy courses, there is the link that is shared with you via this presentation. Please do check it out for more courses that could help you improve your knowledge and awareness about the subject. So we'll see now if um, there are any questions that you would like me to answer, would be happy to. So you can drop them in the chat box. Um, OK. Can I can I ask the question? It's writing it down. Sure. I think if there will be uh, no questions in five minutes or so, we will be uh, wrapping up uh, the session. But happy to hear from you if there is any question that you would like me to answer. Uh, 
OK, a question has just come through. Could you please suggest a few ways to start an investment journey for students? OK, um, I think for students, it's it's very important to understand that obviously the the safest and the easiest way uh, to think about investments is if they are willing to basically. Uh, or they have the ability to uh, join any of the safe saving schemes. Uh, see, it's it's very important to understand that for students, uh, the level of income obviously would be limited uh, at that point in time. And also they wouldn't you would not want to take the risk uh, with any type of, of investments that would actually make you lose that money. So there are actually certain saving schemes that are offered by insurance companies, some of the insurance companies that are available for students. All right, and whereby they will actually be taking a, a part of, of your income and saving it over some of it during the, the college or during the period where you are a student. All right, and for a premium that needs to, to be paid. And then at the end of the, uh, the period of your educational period, this is where it will basically repay you. It's similar as if you would say to an education um, insurance uh, scheme. And this is something that I know a lot of people have actually done uh, during the period when they were students. Now that's one option. Another option is obviously a lot of, um, I would say students now are actually going into the digital uh, platform and starting their new businesses. Some of them are even doing it out of home. I know students who are studying in college and they are able to actually avail uh, very nice products and services uh, even from um, from home and that's a kind of service and, and you would do the marketing on the digital platform using word of mouth using families uh, connections um, and and some of them for example they started doing um, things like uh, maybe homemade uh, desserts or homemade food or um, some digital services like I came across a very interesting uh, application that was done by a student in Pakistan uh, where he actually created uh, an application similar to Uber uh, but it's it's not Uber so basically what happens is if you let's say you're leaving your home and you're going to Seif area from Manama uh, or from Harag and you're going to Seif area, for example. Um, the, on your way, you might have riders who would want to actually go the same destination that you're going. And he created this app to actually tell drivers who own their own cars and they're not taxi drivers or anything, they're normal people. You can have actually people just join you for the ride and pay you for it. And you don't have to go anywhere extra. You're anyway going that direction. You will just help them uh, reach there and you will get paid for it. So this is this is, for example, something that students can uh, can do. Um, I have another question. Um, how to invest in Bahrain stocks? Uh, well, uh, how to invest in Bahrain stocks that, of course, uh, first of all, you need to understand uh, which companies you would be interested in. You will have a platform like the Bahrain Bursa, for it, of course, to go through and see all the listed companies. And uh, checking the which companies are listed, you would understand, of course, the, not, the type of business they're in, the type of segment they're in. And if you're aware of which industry you're interested in, you can look at the history of the stock performance. And then for each company, of course, depending on the requirement, there is a minimum that would be there for the minimum number of shares uh, that you can buy available on how much trading is, is there on, on that particular stock. But of course, the right platform uh, to check that on and to learn more about would be the, the Bahrain Borsa platform. Um, I hope I'm not missing any other question. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Um, yeah, I think. I think that's pretty much. Unless there is anything else. Hello, hello, can you hear me? We'll give it a minute. 
few minutes more, that's okay. Okay, a question just popped in. How to deal with uncertainty? Oh, well, nobody can deal with uncertainty. Um, this 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 is basically uh, I think it's 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 part of our lives you can never deal with uncertainty. However, I and I think maybe you're making reference to uh, financial um, uncertainty. Um, and, and I think this was the basic concept of when we said when 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 you are basically planning yourself, uh, right? The whole concept is whenever you are following a certain plan, um, you are actually able to um, to at least stay put. And then whatever happens, unknown can happen, but at least you were not just all over the place. So for example, you've always made sure your spendings are put, your savings are put, you're not overburdening yourself with finances. Your investments, if any, uh, they're all placed in different types and hence different kinds of risk and, and hence you've di diversified yourself. You're following a plan. Now, whatever happens, the unknown, the uncertainty of tomorrow will always be there, but it's always better to get into the uncertainty planned than not. So, for example, what happened during the COVID, right? It was it was uncertain and it's it was unexpected by the whole world, right? But for those who had made sure um, that they are following a certain plan, when they got into COVID and some people, for example, had businesses that had to shut down uh, because of all the lockdowns and they couldn't make any money during this period. But some of them who made sure they were not over leveraged in terms of not too much borrowing. Some of them who made sure they had quite some savings that they could dig into, right? Because they were planning themselves. So when they got into COVID, it was much easier for them. Not that it was easy, but it was easier for them than those who, of course, didn't see any of this coming, but at the same time, they were taking loans left and right, not making sure they have any savings to make. So I would say this is the best way you can deal with uh, with uncertainty. Um, someone is asking, is there no option to ask questions or only by writing? Um, I'm not sure if you can actually participate. Uh, um, it's I think we we still we still have five minutes to go. Um, if you want to write your question, unfortunately, um, there isn't an unmute option or anything. So if you want, you can answer your question here. You can, I'm sorry, ask your question here. Um, we still have a few minutes to spare. Thank you, thank you, Marwa. Very, very much appreciate your comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope it was informative to everybody and I hope it was light and not too boring. So thank you. So um, I think I'll just repeat uh, everybody, uh, please do refer to uh, the BIBF um, course academy, investment course academy. Um, keep yourself informed, educated. Um, OK, I see one more question. The ability of bank staff to provide proper guidance is very limited. How does one overcome that? OK, I. I well, it, it really depends on on what guidance you are seeking. And now sometimes the person you are dealing with in the bank, his knowledge is limited to what he can offer you. So, for example, if it's a personal loan or a credit card, um, his knowledge would be limited to just knowing exactly what the product is. Remember, bank staff, if they are sales, all right, they are there to sell a product. 
they are not financial advisors and they are actually not allowed by the central bank to be financial advisors. So he is there just to tell you that this loan has this much rate. Uh, these are the charges and, and that's it. If you're expecting him to give you some sort of a financial advice, then he would not be the right person to go to. And that's not the case with one or two banks. That's the case in general. For that, if you're seeking a certain level of financial advice, if you're seeking a certain level of you know, uh, uh, advice related to which product or which option to go for, then you will need to consult people who are in the financial advisory uh, field. Um, and or you will have to obviously do a bit of your own research as well. Um, so I, I, I hope uh, that clarifies um, and answers your question. Um, thank you very much. I think by this we have come to the end of our session and uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for listening and for the good interaction um, and looking forward to seeing you all again. Take care. Bye bye.